A two-year-old vanished after being left alone in a car and his mother believed he had been kidnapped. But while Little Sky was searched for, it was uncovered that a very recent Law & Order episode was eerily similar to this story. Was this abduction story really the plot of a TV show? Was this little boy ever even in that car that day? Was this a cover-up from a mother who murdered her son? Where is Sky Metawala? You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna and today's case is still unsolved, but it's very much one where the public and even investigators have stated their theories very loud and clear but there has not been any arrests whatsoever. So I really think it's important to bring this forward and hopefully someone will speak out soon enough. Now a word from our sponsor, Huge Casino. This is an app game where you can play all of the casino games with no real money gambling. Huge Casino is free to play on iOS and Android to play all of the games inspired by real slots, poker, roulette, blackjack. There are over 100 casino games on this app, all from the retro machines to the more modern machines, all inspired by real life casinos. So you can play your favorite games without having to leave the house or spending any of your precious money. What's your favorite slots? Leave a comment down below. It's strictly for entertainment and you can even play with some of your friends in a billionaire league. So if this sounds interesting, to you, you can download Huge Casino with my link down below and with my link you will get 5 million chips to play with and you can support this channel all in one. So click that link down below. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 2009 in Washington and Sky Elijah Metawala had been born on September 6th of 2009 to Julia Berkova and father Solomon Metawala. Now his parents had actually met around 12 years prior at a convenience store in Bellevue which is where they mostly lived around the same area for the next 12 years, but they instantly bonded over the fact that they were both immigrants to the United States. Julia was born in Soviet Russia and Solomon was born in Pakistan. However, when they met, Solomon was a 21-year-old man and Julia was a 15-year-old high school student. So Solomon invited her to a party and they bonded and began to start a relationship together. And moved pretty quickly and for the next two years Julia finished high school while Solomon worked at his family's restaurant to make some money. After this they decided to buy a home together and four years later in 2003 they married in Solomon's mother's kitchen. It was a very fast no fuss wedding and four years later their first child Mally was born. But around this time the financial situation was a bit of a struggle for the family. There was a restaurant that was competing with Solomon's family restaurant that he worked worked at and so that is where they started struggling and then the Great Recession began and their finances really dipped. But a year later in 2009 they had bought a home in Kirkland and they kept their apartment in Bellevue and then that's when they had their son named Skye. But the bills were piling up so eventually they would get evicted from their home in Kirkland and they moved back to Bellevue. But then in 2010 Solomon filed for divorce. No one really knew what was happening behind the scenes in the his home for all of these years, but their neighbors didn't really like them. You see, they had lots of noise violations against them, especially vacuuming at like 11 p.m. at night. And so after so many warnings, they were actually charged a $300 fee because it just kept happening. But the neighbors also said that the couple was friendly and that Solomon was a very kind, soft-spoken man. So this is when the divorce court proceedings began and Julia was stating that Solomon was actually controlling and very angry and abusive, so much so that she feared for her life. Now she said that she learned of their debt after they were six months behind on payments, that he didn't tell her any of this. And then Solomon was saying that she had made this all up and that Julia was mentally unstable due to her mental problems. But Julia then stated in court documents, now my fear is for my small children and now Solomon is doing the same thing to our small children that he did to me, physically abuse them and try to control them. Two women had also come forward at this time who said that they had actually talked to Julia after her kids had gone on a visit with Solomon and Skye had red marks marks on his lower back and upper buttocks. Now, allegedly these two women heard 
their other child, Mally, who was around four at this time, say that Solomon, their father, got mad that Skye was crying and started to hit him. Mally said, allegedly, that Solomon would hit them over the buttocks with wooden spoons on their butts, on their legs, on their stomach, and would tell them that he didn't love them. Now Solomon heard this and he said, that's something that happened in Julia's past, that she is saying that I did, but she's actually the one who beats the children. But this is when Child Protective Services got involved with Skye and Mally and this family after a claim that Julia made about Solomon saying that he had sexually abused their daughter. The investigation began and it was ruled as unfounded. There was no evidence that Solomon ever did this. But the court decided to go ahead and prohibit him from seeing the children. And this is while their divorce and custody agreements were happening. So it would be around a full year that he wasn't allowed to see his children, not even for visits. But during this time, both the husband and the wife were filing restraining orders against each other. And then in September of 2010, Julie was given full custody of Mally and Skye. Solomon received zero visitation rights whatsoever. And then she posted on Facebook that justice was served today and that her babies were happy and so was she. So this went on where Solomon had zero visitation rights, Julia had full custody, and they were still going through with the divorce and the custody arrangements until November of 2011. And that is when they were ordered a week of mediation to resolve issues. So they had to come to an agreement at this time. So after this, they actually signed a custody arrangement that Julia would continue to have custody, but Solomon would get visitation rights. This looked like it was the end of the feud between the two. They signed this contract until Julia would tell her lawyers the next day that she was pressured into this and she wanted to void the agreement. Now, this was on November 3rd. So at this point, Julia still had full custody of Skye and Mally and in her custody, one of her children would vanish only three days later. On November 6th, around 9.50 a.m., Julia would call the police and she would state that her son Skye had been kidnapped. Now, the Bellevue Police Department would go to Bellevue Road, where the mother had stated she had last seen her son. Julie explained that she had taken Skye and Mally in her car that morning, headed to Overlake Medical Center. This was only around 12 minutes from their home. She claimed that Skye had woken up sick, and so she put them both in the car, and she was on her way, and she was going around the curve of the Washington State Route 520 when they ran out of gas. Now, the closest gas station was said to be around a mile away. So Julie said she parked on the side of the road and decided she was going to have to walk to the gas station. She explained that she strapped in the sleeping sky and left him in the car and took Mally on the walk. Now, an hour later, she reached the Chevron station with her daughter and actually used the payphone to call a friend and this friend would come and pick them up and take them from the gas station to drive back to her car. However, they didn't have gas and Julia didn't have a gas can to take with her. However, when they arrived back at this car, Skye was no longer in the vehicle. He was gone. He was nowhere anywhere to be seen. And the Bellevue police arrived at the scene and they started contacting Skye's father, Solomon, as well. So the search began for a 20 block radius around this car. And a huge question investigators had is why Julia had to walk to make a call when most people would carry their cell phones around this time. But Julia would say that she had left the home without her purse, her wallet, or her phone that day. So Julia was taken to the police station to answer further questions and she would grant investigators permission to search her home, her car, her computer. And she claimed that her son Skye was biracial. He was Asian and Caucasian. He had black hair, brown eyes, and was wearing a gray or green hooded sweatshirt, aqua and black striped Carter sweatpants with an elastic waist and white socks. She was seeming to be cooperative, but then they asked her if she would take a polygraph test and she refused. Her lawyer claimed this was because Julia was mentally unstable and that the test were notoriously unreliable. During the search of Julia's vehicle, which was still parked on the side of the road, they found it unlocked. There was no sign of forced entry as though someone had forced their way into this car to kidnap this little boy. But the strangest part was when they turned on the car, it turned on immediately and they realized it had plenty of gas. It was nowhere near empty. In fact, it had about 2.2 gallons of gas, more than enough to get to the hospital. 
This was the whole reason that Julia had left Sky behind and it was no longer valid. The car also had no trouble turning on or driving. It ran smoothly. And the route that Julia and Mally had taken to get to this gas station to ask for help was retraced. And it was found that there were multiple homes on that walk that they could have gone to for help, asked to use their phone, much closer to the vehicle where she had left her child inside. Something wasn't adding up and investigators knew this. And this is when Julia was no longer talking to the police. Since Solomon had been contacted about his son, he was asked to come down to the police department. He agreed to a lie detector test and a search of his home as well. Nothing was found in his home and his test results came back as inconclusive. Investigators actually said it was because he was emotionally drained and tired and hearing this, Solomon agreed to come back and take another test the next day. Though the results of that test were never actually shared to the public. Please just, just return him back. Sky was still missing and the odd thing was investigators set up a roadblock along that road to hopefully catch drivers who often went that route to work or wherever they were going to see if they had seen the car or Sky the day he vanished. A few drivers had said they had actually seen this car parked on the side of the road between 8 and 10 a.m. Many of them said that they had never seen a child inside. During a press conference, police major Mike Johnson said nothing about this story adds up. Something else happened. He also stated then that the mom wasn't willing to come in to provide a polygraph test and it looked suspicious. We believe something suspicious is, is, at, is at foot here. Um, we'd like to know what it is. We have been challenged to try and find evidence and facts to support Julia's story. There was uh, a sufficient amount of gas in that vehicle to run it for a considerable, considerable distance. They were saying that they were puzzled by that, and it was announced that Julia was provided housing while they went and searched her home for evidence, and the FBI had joined them. It's unknown if the mother had a, a cell phone with her at the time or a working cell phone, which is one of the reasons she got out of the car and walked to the nearby gas station to get gas and call a friend to help her out. If after 48 hours, we don't have a child that's been missing, uh, then it's a good assumption that there's been some type of foul play. Julia's brother had told police that Julia had called him that day that he vanished and was crying frantically. But this is when investigators started to speak to anybody who knew Julia, Sky, the family, and the neighbors of Julia where she was living claimed that they hadn't seen Sky in around two weeks. Solomon then claimed that he, nor anyone he knew, had actually seen Sky since April, when Skye had a doctor's appointment. This was eight months prior. But for Solomon, for many of these months, he didn't have visitation. So he wasn't actually allowed to go see Skye or Mally. So it was not strange for him to have not seen his son and not put up a fight during that time. But investigators began to play with the theory that Skye was never in that vehicle that day. But his four-year-old sister, Mally, had spoken to police and she told them that Skye was with them that morning. And after scouring Julia's computer, investigators found that she had a Facebook page, just a personal one, where she was often posting pictures of Mally, uh, very, very rarely of Sky. She had also been going on a sugar daddy dating website looking for a man to support her. She requested $3,000 to $5,000 per month in cash. And her profile said, happy, single, loving, fun, passionate, kind, healthy, beautiful, great, cook, blonde hair, blue eyes, slim, very fit, Christian, mommy of two beautiful babies. I speak fluent Russian, Ukrainian, and English. I live in Redmond, Washington. I'm looking for financial stability and assistance. I'm looking for a successful mentor. I'm looking for a real man. You tell me your ideal arrangement. After this was uncovered, police did ask for information from anyone who might have spoken to her through this dating website, and not much has been said about that investigation. But after looking further into this family, investigators found that there was a very eerily similar case involving these parents. You see, back in 2009, two years prior, the police had been called to a Target parking lot for a baby left inside a vehicle. It was negative three degrees outside and no one returned to the car for an hour. Finally, Julia and Solomon returned and they claimed that they didn't want to wake Sky, so they went in for about 20 minutes. However, CCTV footage showed that it was more like an hour and due to this, they were arrested and charged with reckless endangerment. They both admitted to leaving children behind for long periods of time, but Sky was only two months old at this point. 
though they never actually went to court for these charges. Instead, the charges were dropped if they agreed to take a parenting class, and Solomon would later say he made a huge mistake and learned a very valuable lesson. But after the details of Skye's disappearance came out, the public were very shocked at the similarities between a real-life vanishing and a fictional crime that they had just watched on TV. You see, the show Law & Order Special Victims Unit had recently aired an episode called Missing Pieces. This was season 13, episode 5, about a young couple whose baby boy was abducted when he was left in their car. He was in the back seat when the car was stolen, and she was only gone for a few minutes to grab diapers. However, the end of the story in this show it's much worse because in this fictional episode the couple had actually buried the baby believing they accidentally killed him and then used this story of abduction as a cover-up to get away with it but what are the odds of sky's parents watching this exact episode before he disappeared well it aired two weeks prior to sky's disappearance and it turned out it replayed this exact episode, the night before he disappeared. Solomon has since said that Law & Order was one of Julia's favorite shows, and Major Mike Johnson said that many have found it strikingly similar in nature to the real case. The question is, what are the real options in regard to what happened to this child? And the answer is that until we can rule out every option, and they're, and they're all the obvious ones, kidnapping, abduction, um, lost, um, some kind of, you know, custody, you know, battle that got involved here and, and somehow led to uh, one family member taking him. All, the, all those sort of things yes. that you've theorized about, we've theorized about as well. And we're going we're gonna to work through all of those things and try and narrow it down throughout the weekend. Given the amount of time that's passed, I believe this is day six, you know, unfortunately the reality of, of, of this is that uh, Sky may have, you know, fallen under some very un unfortunate circumstances. And now, it turned out that Julia had quite an interesting childhood and marriage. She claimed as a child in Russia, she would be sent to mental hospitals when she was being punished, and they would give her shock therapy. When she was not in mental hospitals, she said she was beaten by her parents, and after moving to the States and meeting Solomon, the couple seemed happy. However, the Kirkland reporter found that Julia would later say that Solomon was controlling, believed himself to be a Christ-like figure who had great persuasive skills. She had once said she became emotionally dependent on Solomon for her identity and her self-esteem. Julia would also later admit to her own family that she only married him because she was given an ultimatum by Solomon's family that she would either never see him again or she needed to marry him because he was being deported. Julie was also said to butt heads with her in-laws over religion, especially when Solomon converted to Christianity. Now, Solomon's side of the story about their marriage and their relationship was stated in court papers during the divorce proceedings, and he claimed that after having Skye, the second child, Julia started having psychological problems, that she would make them eat outside of the home, sleep on the floor, also the house could stay clean. It's very hard to talk about this. Um, she... I know that you are upset. I understand that she would not let you use the commode. What happened? I wasn't allowed to. I, I, I wasn't allowed to. But why? wasn't allowed to. I mean, she, she used it. That wasn't a problem. Uh, but she just told me I couldn't use it. He said he did so to make her happy, but before this, when Julia was pregnant with Skye, she admitted to being prescribed antidepressants. However, she didn't think she needed them, so she didn't take them. So it's not believed she got any help after that, but between 2009 and 2010, CPS had been called about this family around six times where nothing was done. They would allegedly find the home in a better condition than the children were, and Solomon would tell them that he would often come home throughout the day while he was working to take care of the children to go out and get them something to eat because Julia wasn't leaving the house. She locked herself in there like a prisoner. Once they were called about the statements that Mally had made alleging that 
that Solomon had hit them over, you know, the buttocks, the back with wooden spoons. And she allegedly told caseworkers the same story, but Solomon denied hitting her with a spoon. Though he was given a polygraph test for this, and when he was asked if he caused the bruising, it was inconclusive. But by the time Sky was one, Julia was being admitted to the mental hospital. She had told Solomon, who was still her husband at this time, that she dreamed of killing the children, specifically strangling Sky. A psychologist, though, at this mental hospital said that she was not psychotic and believed that she only agreed to be committed under spousal duress. Though she would be committed again after texting Solomon that she wanted to take her life. These texts said, please, please, I'm begging you with my whole heart, help me find a peaceful way to die. I cannot live another day and cause you, Mally, and Sky any more suffering. I'm dead inside anyway and have been dead for a long time. You will not miss me at all and Mally and Sky have the best daddy in the world, so I know they will be okay. She said this while she was home alone with Skye, so Solomon called the police to come to their home, and when they arrived, Julia agreed to go to the hospital. A psychiatrist there had diagnosed her with OCD and believed she was still fit to parent a child. So she was released, but Solomon couldn't get over this and actually filed for divorce. So that is where the divorce began, but it wasn't where the mental hospital stays ended. The next time she was committed, she told the psychologist that she had only said all of this, these texts, to get Solomon's attention. But Julia would be given a global assessment of functioning, a test of 1 to 100, and she was given a score of 15, meaning that she was a danger to herself and others. This is when she first arrived. However, by the time she was released, it had improved to slightly impaired in reality, testing, and communication, and was at a 40. But then Julia voluntarily admitted herself to the University of Washington Medical Center and was dropped off by Solomon and his brother. She told them that she wanted to go here because she believed that her condition wasn't being taken seriously elsewhere. So in these court documents in the divorce, Solomon had spoken about this time where Julia was committed to the mental hospital and he said, I'm not exaggerating when I state under oath that Julia cared more about cleaning a countertop than she did about feeding our daughter. The child was ignored and it became a matter of great concern. In these same documents, Julia's own mother, Nadia, agreed, claiming that she told Julia, neither your husband nor I would like for you to live with us at your current conditions. All of us, including your children, are suffering from your abuse. So these were the mental problems that Solomon had spoke about during the divorce proceedings. He claimed that because of her OCD, she couldn't keep food in the house. They weren't allowed to eat in the house because of crumbs. They couldn't dirty the bed sheets so they couldn't sleep in their bed. She also couldn't keep a job because she insisted on cleaning around six to seven hours a day. She was said to clean areas over and over again. Neighbors said she rarely left the house with the kids though Julia was still awarded full custody of the children after hearing this. She then told Solomon she wouldn't ask for any alimony if he would allow her to move to Arizona and take the kids. He refused this. Just before one of their children vanished. It was also found that Julia and Solomon, on their mediation session where they were finally, or so it was thought, coming to an arrangement in the divorce and the custody, Julia had actually left the kids alone for 11 hours. And remember, this is a two-year-old and a four-year-old. But at this point, Julia was not a prime suspect. She was not a person of interest. At the very least, many said that Julia could have been charged with child endangerment after leaving Skye in the car alone but she was never arrested for that. Though the police were very vocal that they did not believe Julia's story, especially after seeing this Law & Order episode. Then Julia's mother, Nadia, changed her story around this time, saying that her daughter wasn't as sick as Solomon had led her to believe during the time of her mental hospital stays. So she was now back on her daughter's side. Julia still wasn't talking, not to anybody, but two weeks later, ABC News sent an email to who they believed was Julia. She had emailed them back saying she had no idea where her child was and that her ex-husband was a sadistic Muslim Pakistani who was not telling the truth. That no one had any idea and it was also difficult. Due to this being over email though, it cannot be confirmed this was actually from Julia and Solomon heard this and believed that she was just trying to rile him up. Um, um, in 2005, um, I, 
I, I got saved. Um, and the reason that it struck me because, um, and this is kind of a, a not a not a great way to get into this, but you know, we were talking a little bit about these emails that I think your estranged wife has sent to a news network, right. and um, she says she doesn't say a lot in those emails, but it what it seems to be kind of clear is her resentment for you. You're not Muslim, is that correct? Correct. She probably knows you're not Muslim. Correct. Do you know why she would say something like that? You know, she 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 still uh, is just uh, lashing out in anger. I mean, we're we're moving from what is the main reason mm -hmm. why we are on TV. You know, is to promote Sky's awareness, mm -hmm. and um, for her to take a cheap shot to. At me, that's so irrelevant. Like I am trying to, to use all my energy, and there's not too much. I might have to say, um, but I, I'm just trying to focus uh, on the prize, and the prize is getting Sky back home, and trying to do anything that I can uh, to bring more. Because it only takes one person. So oh, yeah, you know, I yes, I did see see, see that person. And that's all it takes. Do you remember what your last, would you be willing to share that with us, your last memory of seeing him? Yeah, of course. Um, I think this was the, the, the second last time. Is that mm -hmm. okay? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think I already shared this, but it was such a cool moment. Um, so Miley and Skye are, are, are in the back, uh, and I'm driving. And um, Miley starts to scream, you know, just, ah. Uh, and and, and Skye does the same thing. Then Miley does it a little louder. Sky does it a little louder. Okay. Then one more time. This is after the third time, they both just laugh and laugh and laugh. It was just so funny. It was so cool to see a brother and sister working together for laughing wise. Mm -hmm. I mean, they did this on their own. You know, I didn't go. I was just just looking, not looking, but I was driving. Hearing, hearing, hearing. That's probably the proper word to say. Now, Julia still had custody of Mally at this point, but after no more information was being found about Skye's whereabouts, the Washington Child Protective Services did remove four-year-old Mally from her mother. Now, Julia was not allowed to have contact with her, and CPS found that Mally had actually been listening to her mother so much, saying things like she wanted to kill herself, that Mally started saying this as well. But instead of being placed with her father, Solomon, she was placed in foster care. But Solomon could see her twice weekly, and he was also working towards petitioning for custody. And so a year after his disappearance in 2012, Skye had still not been found. Julie and Solomon's divorce was finalized, and Solomon was given custody of Mally, finally. But many weren't thrilled how the Bellevue police had handled this investigation, specifically with the lack of arrest of Julia who even they said was suspicious. However, they said it was a very strategic decision in case evidence was later found of Skye being murdered or kidnapped by his mother and was never actually in that car. So they didn't want to charge her with leaving him there if he was actually never there. That year, the Web Sleuths community band together hoping to find Skye. They wanted to narrow down the time when Skye actually went missing. They were going through photos. They actually found calendars in the background of some of the photos. And so they were really narrowing down this timeline and this renewed interest in the case. But it was theorized that Skye hadn't been seen in eight months prior to his abduction story. It was found that eight months prior, there was somebody who came into town who could have taken him. You see, Julia and her father, they were estranged. But back in April 2011, eight months prior to his disappearance, when Solomon last saw his son at the doctor's visit, Julia's father visited from the Ukraine. So it had been theorized that maybe he went back to the Ukraine and he took his grandson with him. Meaning that possibly over those next eight months, Julia kept it quiet. And then she finally watched this Law & Order episode and realized how she was going to cover it up. But again, that is just a theory. No one had any proof of this. But Julia had moved on with her life. However, it had gone down a much darker path. In 2014, only three years after her son vanished, Julia remarried, and this was to a man named Alan Morgan. He turned out to have a criminal record for domestic assault, violence, violence against the police, battery, and cruelty to a child. 
He was an alcoholic addicted to meth and was often homeless. But the same month they would marry, Julia actually then went to the police claiming that he assaulted her and he, she wanted a no contact order. She was given this, but then she would go and visit him in jail. But in 2015, four years after this abduction story, the new police chief at Bellevue, Steve Milet, was determined to solve this case. So he went to a local newspaper and he said that he wanted to talk to Julia. But around this time, Julia was pregnant with her third child, her first with Alan Morgan, as his name was on the birth certificate to her, their son, Elijah James Morgan using her first son Sky's middle name. But when CPS went to remove the child from her care due to, of course, everything that had happened previously and Alan's criminal record, Julia told them that she didn't know who the father was. But CPS decided to place Elijah in the care of Julia's mother, Nadia. They were all living together. So Julia still got to see her son. And even though the police chief was begging Julia to come in just to talk, she never contacted them. In 2019 though, Julia went to court to testify against Alan Morgan, her ex-husband or her husband, I guess, that violated the no contact order. During this, reporters tried to ask her questions about Skye, but she refused to talk. You are not allowed to be alone with your son without a monitor, right? Correct. Bellevue, Bellevue police have been asking for seven years now for a response to what happened to Sky Metawalla. Why won't you talk to Bellevue police? She's not going to give a comment. Bellevue police say you are the only person who knows where Sky Metawalla is. Where is Sky Metawalla? She's not going to comment. Alan was then released from prison and ordered into treatment. However, he left early and then was wanted. Around this time, Solomon was taking care of Mally and told Seattle Times that she was doing well, that she's smart and adventurous, and that thankfully she doesn't have any memory of what happened to Skye or anything during that time. But in 2021, 10 years since Skye was last seen, his mother Julia was arrested on a shoplifting charge for stealing clothes at Costco. Alan then said that their child Elijah should be put into foster care and not just living with the mother's mother. And because of this, Julie was actually forced to move out of her mother's home where Elijah lived. That same year, the Bellevue Police Department Major Debbie Christofferson said that they have asked Julia to come in to speak with him again and again, but she has not cooperated since the first abduction story, the first day. So an age progress photo has been released since, and the Bellevue Police Department has stated that they have spent more than $2 million on this case and followed up on 2,500 leads that have gone nowhere. Sky's father Solomon told King 5 News, there's no evidence that says he's not alive. So I still kind of stand on that to keep myself going. So if anyone has information regarding the case of Sky Metawala, please contact the Bellevue Police Department at the number and I will have a link down below. For the most part, it seems like everybody involved, including those who enforce the law, know and understand what happened and they don't want to go ahead and charge this individual in a wrong manner that could get them released if evidence ever comes out of what actually happened, which does make sense, but it's still so infuriating because will we ever find that evidence that links what actually happened to Sky? Do you think she actually did see that Law & Order episode two weeks prior or the night prior and decided that that was how she was going to cover up whatever actually happened? Do you think she murdered Sky? You think Sky is still alive? I want to be with his father on this one that there's no evidence that he's not. And I hope one day that his father will get the answers that he so desperately seeks. But it makes me so happy to hear that Solomon is the sole guardian of his daughter once again. But there are so many discrepancies in what this family was actually like and there's so much back and forth. It's so unclear. I think it's interesting that allegedly Julia herself had said that she wanted to go to this different mental hospital because they didn't know how to treat her condition. Was that the OCD? Did she feel like there was more? I could only find a diagnosis of OCD for her, but maybe there was something else that she knew she had or that others had diagnosed her with that we don't even know about. But the fact that for 14 years, the last person to see a missing child 
has just not had to ever talk to investigators again. It just gives me chills. Refusing a polygraph test is one thing, but then to never speak to investigators again and for that to be allowed, it's hard to fathom. What do you think about the statement that Mally made as a four-year-old that Sky was in the car that day? Do you think this was something she was fed by her mother before the police got there? Do you think she was telling the truth? Do you think she had no idea what she was saying at all because she was a four-year-old and sometimes they just say things to say things? What do you think? So please, if you know anything about Sky Matawala or what happened to him, if you've heard any sort of little information, if you saw something strange that day or in the months prior, or if you yourself have Sky, please come forward and just give this father answers. That is what he wants more than anything, is to be able to have his son in his arms again. I just want to put Sky's face out there and hopefully someone will see him and know especially in the age progress photo that they have seen him before. And then we will know that he's out there somewhere still alive. That's my biggest hope. But don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye. Also, don't forget you can download Huge Casino and get 5 million chips down below.